Um, so I'm going to be doing a follow-up today from our last reading of First Peter. But this is going to be First Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. Verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. I took quite a few notes here, so just bear with me a second. So I'm gonna go back to the part where it says that we are called to be holy. What does it mean when it says we are called to be holy? Many are called, but few are chosen. We know this from the Bible. But why are many called and few chosen? Simply because they don't want to do the necessary work to sanctify their temple, his dwelling place, the dwelling place of his holy spirit the first thing that we're told to do is prepare our minds for action then it follows up by telling us how we prepare our minds it says by being sober minded how many of you know it becomes increasingly difficult to make rational decisions or sound judgments when you're intoxicated high or under the influence. Your perception and awareness is off. It's distorted. Your reaction time is not as good. You can easily be caught off guard and make costly mistakes when you're not sober-minded. You become more impulsive and less likely to think things through or weigh out the consequences or even consider possible outcomes. Then it says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So let's dig deeper into that verse right there. Does this mean to not pay attention to what's happening around us? To ignore it altogether or to stay blissfully ignorant? In order to do what is required of us, which is to expose the unfruitful works of darkness and have no part in them we need to be aware of what's happening around us not to the part the point where we're being consumed because all we ever do is watch the news but we do need to be aware aware of what's happening in the world in order to speak out against it to be a voice for the voiceless to be a voice for those who are not speaking out against it so yes by all means Focus on heavenly things. We're told to do this. To focus on things that are pure and, and right and holy, but also be watchful. Be watchful. Be sober-minded. Look forward to Jesus' return on clouds of glory, but also be mindful of what's happening around you. And don't just accept it. Don't just accept it because it's the cultural norm. Speak out as obedient children. That's what it tells us to be as obedient children. So what is the opposite of that? What is the opposite of an obedient child? Well, for example, if we know what the Bible says, 
and we conveniently ignore certain parts of it because it doesn't line up with our preferences or because we want to continue living in debauchery. Is that being an obedient child? Does an obedient child who knows exactly what's expected of them pick and choose which instructions to follow? Does an obedient child blatantly and in the parent's face do something they know that their parents wouldn't approve of? Does an obedient child demand that allowances be made so that they can still have what they want? No. A rebellious child does that. And the Bible tells us that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. A rebellious child knows exactly what's expected of them and then, then does the polar opposite. A rebellious child insists on having their own way even when they know there's consequences attached to their disobedience. Then it says, be not conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Be not conformed. Conformed in the Greek means to be molded according to a pattern. So basically what this is telling us is don't alter your newfound principles trying to fit in with the cultural norms. And why would we try to fit in with the cultural norms when we're supposed to be set apart? Why would we try to fit in with the cultural nor norms when we know that Satan is the lowercase g, God of this world? Why would we try to fit in with the cultural norms when we know that the earth and everything in it are perishing? To be conformed also means to form or mold one's behavior in accordance with a particular pattern or a set of standards. So basically, it's telling us here not to lower or compromise our newfound standards. Don't follow the crowd. Don't do what everybody else does for the sake of their praise, approval, or acceptance because we're told in the Bible enmity, I mean, sorry, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. There's also a, a Bible verse that says, if you seek to please man, you are not fit to be his disciple. So because we know that the, the world and culture are getting more and more rebellious against the things of God, the Antichrist spirit is alive and well. Because we know this, we're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to come out from among them. We're supposed to be holy as he is holy. As Christians, we're not supposed to fit the mold of culture. We're supposed to stand out like a city on a hill. We can't do that if we look and act like those who are perishing and without hope in the world. This is just the truth. The Bible says the truth will set you free. Without the spirit of truth, how can one be possibly be led into all truth? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The spirit of God is the oil you better have in your lamp when Jesus comes back for his bride. You don't want to be like the five other virgins who because they had no oil got left behind so how do we keep our lamps burning bright we stay in fellowship regular communion with the one who gave us life and breath who knows the way in which we should go because he is the way the steps of the righteous are ordered by the lord he promises to be a, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path on this rock we stand and all other ground is sinking sand. The next verse says, as he who called you is holy, be holy in your conduct. What does it mean to be holy? 
in our conduct. Let's explore some, some other Bible verses first before we answer that question. In Matthew 5, 16, it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Since we know that the Antichrist spirit is alive and well even now and that we are in the last days and the darkness just continues to take over the earth, we need to be like torches for the kingdom of God. Let your light so shine before men. But in order to do that, again, we're not to be conformed. We're not to be dragged into what the culture is doing and act like everybody else and participate in the things that they participate in. No, you were pulled out of the world for a reason. You were set apart for a reason. And they, in order to, for them to see your good works, they need to see something different in you that's unlike the culture, that's unlike the norm. And when they see that, what ends up happening is that they glorify your Father in heaven. They glorify God. Keep in mind that any, any good works that we do as children of God are not of our flesh. Any good works that we do as a true child of God, good works of the flesh have no benefit whatsoever. But the Holy Spirit is the one who enables and equips us for the good works we now have the pleasure of being a part of. Amen. What a privilege to be a part of God's glorious plan in any capacity. Sign me up. I want to be a part of the move of God in this earth, especially at a time such, <laughs> such as this. I want to be a city on a hill, especially at a time such as this. Psalm 34, 14 tells us to turn away from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it back to that holy conduct. As a Christian, and the word Christian means to be Christ-like, we're supposed to seek peace and pursue it. We're supposed to pursue peace, to strive for peace at all costs. Does that mean only when other people are being peaceful towards us? No, we are to strive for peace and attempt to be peaceful even when others are not, even when others are venomous, even when others persecute us, even when others revile us, even when others are, are saying nothing but hateful rhetoric. We are to strive for peace and attempt to be peaceful. That's what it means to shard your feet with the gospel of peace. What is the opposite of that? It's when we cause strife, when we cause division, when we cause discord, contention, when we're argumentative, when we're quarrelsome or combative, when we react in anger from a place of vengeance, when we're vindictive or acting out of spitefulness or maliciousness or speaking from a place of bitterness, resentment or offense. Those things are far from striving for peace. 2 Timothy 2.23 tells us to stay away from foolish and stupid arguments. Now, I'm sure we all have an opinion and we all want to be heard, but unfortunately, that's, that's our flesh. Our flesh needs to be right. Our flesh needs to have the last word. Our flesh needs to prove our point. Our flesh needs to, needs to be heard. But the Bible says, stay away from these foolish and stupid arguments. Why? We're told to turn our eyes away from foolish and stupid arguments, but worthless things. There is no benefit to having these kind of discussions. So basically it's telling us avoid them at all costs. Avoid them. Don't entertain them. Don't get dragged into them. Foolish controversies. Ephesians 4.29 tells us 
Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit who listens. I want to talk for a second about what that word unwholesome means. Just so we're clear, it says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Unwholesome in Greek means harmful, injurious, destructive, rotten, decayed, corrupt, disgusting, foul, unfit, worthless, and defiling. How many of us know out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? We're told that in Luke 6, 45 and Matthew 12, 34 to 40. We're also told in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If these things are coming out in your daily conversations, if you gravitate towards gossip, if you jump on that bandwagon when you see another Christian brother or sister being attacked because you had some suspicions of your own, we're actually told in the Bible that wherever there is strife, division, discord, contention, these things, every evil thing exists. It means that Satan is literally behind that person pulling the strings don't let that be you. Exit the conversation. The Bible says it is not what goes into the mouth of a man that defiles him. So we don't need to be worried about the food that he's consuming. But what defiles him is actually what comes out of his mouth. Because the Bible says that we will be held accountable for every idol careless word that we speak every idle word that we speak about someone who was created in the image and likeness of the almighty god let's go on to verse 18 Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold. You were ransomed. You had an enormous debt to pay. And you don't have enough in your account, nor would you ever have enough in your account to pay that debt. Jesus Christ got up on the cross bled out and atoned for every single bit of that debt. Not just the debt that you had already accumulated, but any debt that you would accumulate going forward. You were ransomed. You were bought back. You were a slave. Who were you a slave to? The God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, Satan himself. That's who you were a slave to and that's who you serve. There is no happy medium here. You either serve God or the devil. And the choice is yours. That's why we've been given free will. Not with perishable things such as silver or gold. So basically we're, we're told in the Bible, don't store up earth, earthly treasures. Don't, don't worry about all these possessions and you know the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Don't get sucked into that. It's a vortex. It's like never ending. And no matter how much you accumulate, it will never be enough. You will never be content. You will never be fully satisfied. You will always want more. So don't worry about earthly treasures that rust and perish and fade away and won't always be here. And when you die, you can't take them with you. Store up treasures in heaven that can't rust, perish, or fade. It goes on to say, but with the precious blood of Christ, 
like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. The blood of Jesus Christ, the holy, righteous, sanctifying blood of Jesus Christ is like a sacrifice, a lamb without blemish or spot, not a single defect. That was the blood that atoned for the debt that you owed. That was the blood that was poured out on your behalf so that you could be imputed his righteousness because your righteousness is filthy rags. It's filthy rags. No matter what you do on your best day, you cannot... You, you cannot save yourself. You cannot attain your own salvation. We, we were filthy before the Father. However, now God himself, clothed in flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, has atoned for the sin of the entire world if we would just repent and believe in the gospel. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. He was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. There's many people out there today that feel like God is some far away being. God the Father is, is, is spirit. Jesus is God manifested in flesh. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit of God that comes to dwell and make your temple as a child of God once you repent and believe in the gospel, his dwelling place. But not only was he made manifest in the last times for the sake of you so that you could come out from judgment, so that you could be made, so you could be justified before the Father, which means made right, made righteous in his sight, not only did he do that not only to atone for your sins that you committed and the sins that you would commit going forward? Yes, there's a certain grace there. We were saved by grace through faith. Hallelujah. But he was also made manifest to give us something to worship that we could visibly see. Jesus was a man and he walked among us on the earth, but he was fully God and fully man. And we're able to relate because he's gone through every single thing that we could possibly go through, all the, all the struggles of life. He knows what shame is. He knows what humiliation is. He knows what guilt is. He knows what it's like to be falsely accused he knows what it's like to be betrayed by somebody that he considered a friend he knows what it's like to be thrown into a, a prison cell for a crime that he did not commit he did all of these things not just to reconcile us back to himself but to give us a god that we could relate to who could relate to us because he's a very personal God who loves relationship. See, he wanted to reconcile us back to himself because he wanted relationship, not religion. Religion is dead. Religion never saved anyone. Religion is all about your, your list, your to-do list and checking off everything so that you know that you're still on God's in God's good graces. But that's not how this thing works. You are saved by grace through faith. You are saved by grace 
through faith and that faith was a, a gift from God and after he gave you that precious gift of faith that you then exercised you were made right in his sight and then after that he made you his child you went from being a child of wrath to a, a child of God hallelujah but now we don't just continue on in, in the foolishness of our former ignorance, right? When you know better, you will do better. And how do we know better? Well, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we know better when we start to read the word, but not just read it, but really meditate on the scripture and really ask ourselves, what does this mean and, and how can I apply this to my life, to my relationships, to this situation that I'm facing? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. We must not only just believe in God, we have to believe that he is who he says he is. Even the demons believe and tremble, so it's not just enough to believe, which is where repentance comes in. Repentance is that grief, that godly sorrow that comes in when you realize that you missed the mark and God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. And when he was up on that cross saying, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He was referring to you. Verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. I'm going to read that one more time. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. So this gives us a remedy right here that obedience to the truth, obedience to God's word equals or equates to the purification of our souls. What is our soul? Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. So that becomes purified by what? By our obedience to the truth, by our obedience to God's word. God's number one commandment is to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. The next verse says, a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Don't just love other people with your words. Love them in deeds. Love them through your actions. Show them that they are loved and cared for. Anybody can speak an empty word. But the action behind it tells us all we need to know. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. A pure heart would be, I love you with no ulterior motives. A pure heart would be, I love you without expecting anything from you in return. A pure heart would say, I love you even when... We're not in agreement when we have a, a disagreement, when we, we can't meet eye to eye on a certain topic. I love you still. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but if of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God, you have been born again. 
You have been born again. You are a new creature. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now don't you see it spring forth? You are not the same individual. You went from being a child of wrath to a child of God. You went from being in darkness into his marvelous light. You went from being rebellious to being obedient. You went from being completely ignorant of the sin that you are living in to painfully aware that how you have been living is wrong. He gave you a new heart. He took your heart of stone. He gave you a heart of flesh. This is what it means to be born again, not a worldly sorrow that is upset for things like getting caught. No, this is a godly sorrow. It's much deeper than that. You are grieved. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives you the ability to be grieved in such a way. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. So what else does it mean to be born again it says you're a, a new creature you're you're not the same anymore you've been set apart you've been chosen you've been pulled out of the world and you weren't just chosen at that moment god chose you before the foundations of the earth were laid All flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. See, everything else on this earth is going to perish. It's all going to fade away. We all have this date where life expires and we have to come face to face with our, our maker, our creator, our redeemer, our redeemer, our Lord. However, we know him. We have to come face to face with him and give an account of what's been done on the earth. So everything else is going to fall away. Everything else is going to perish. Everything else is going to pass on. But the word of the Lord remains forever. Jesus is the word made flesh the tomb is empty he is risen he is alive and active and sharper than a double-edged sword he is, he, he is eternal he has always existed he is the beginning and the end the alpha and the omega the first and the last no one created him he is God And he remains forever. And our soul is eternal and our soul is going to either remain with the Lord forever. In his presence forever. And in his presence, how many of us know in his presence is fullness of joy? Well, I don't know about you, but that's where I want to be. I want to be in the presence of the Lord. I want to be in, in the fullness of his joy he created joy. I want to be with him forever. What's the alternative? To be with Satan and his angels forever. Those are the two decisions that we've been given. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I encourage you that if you haven't called upon the name of the Lord that you would give that a try. I know you might even be satisfied with your life the way that it is right now. You might be perfectly content and think that there's nothing that you need. But if you're honest with yourself, there's an area in your life where you've always felt like you didn't fit in. There's an area of your life where you always felt like no matter what you got into, 
You were never content. You, it felt like you were always searching and seeking. It felt like you were trying to attain some sort of connection with with something, but you didn't even know what you were looking for. You just wanted to understand your your purpose. You wanted to understand what why you are here and what you were created for. You've tried to find your niche. Maybe you've moved around from job to job and there's no real fulfillment in what you're doing. It's because there never will be any real fulfillment in what you're doing until you're aligned with God's purpose and plan for you. You will never be content living out your own purpose and plan. And if you are, it will be that blissfully ignorant contentment. But there's still going to be a part of you that if you're honest with yourself, feels empty. And you'll always be seeking and searching for how you can how you can attain that that wholeness how you can attain that wholeness how you can attain that level of happiness that you've always wanted how you can attain a certain level of peace that you've never been able to acquire call on the name of the lord call on jesus christ call on your father in heaven ask him to come into your life Ask him to reveal himself to you in all his glory. Ask him to, to change the way that you think, the way that you perceive things, the way that you relate to people, the way that you respond and react. Ask him to show you what true peace is, not the temporary peace that the world gives. Ask him to show you the joy that can only be found in his presence. Ask him to introduce you to the one who gave you life and breath. To reveal himself to you in a way that you've never experienced before. Be so bold as to call on the name of the Lord if you don't believe in him. That's that's quite all right because if you call on the name of the Lord, that in itself is an act of faith. And if you can do that, well, faith the size of a mustard seed. Faith the size of a mustard seed can shift a mountain into the sea. So what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Do you think that you're always going to have all this time? I'll go to God when I'm ready. I'll call on God when I when I need him. I'm young right now. I'm not trying to really uh, live for him. I'd rather live for myself. No, life is like a vapor. Tomorrow is not promised. We do not know when our last day is going to be. But God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, he sacrificed his life not only so that you could spend eternity with him in heaven, in a paradise, in the new Jerusalem, no, he sacrificed his life so that you could know him intimately and personally like you've never known him before because before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you, but now it's time for you to know him. And it's really, it's impossible because his understanding is unsearchable to know God in his fullness, but he loves to reveal himself little by little to his children. He loves to commune with us. We serve a personal God who can relate to us on every level. He wants to be a part of everything that you do and every choice that you make because he can protect you from yourself. He can protect you from making the wrong choices and decisions. And he wants to do just that. 
He wants to do just that. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to commune to you, with you. He wants to show you great and mighty things that you know not. So again, if you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Now is the time. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, God in the flesh, and that he walked among us, he dwelt among us on the earth. He dwelt among us on the earth. He died on a cross. He sacrificed himself to, to atone for the sin of the world. He died. He was buried in a rich man's grave in a tomb and three days later rose again. Not only did he rise again, but he was seen by 500 witnesses, including his disciples. That's all the proof you need. Call on the name of the Lord. They who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. No exceptions.